to edge or not to edge? You know, one of the most common Schmitt-Cassegrain questions I get around here is, should I spring for the edge variant in the larger Celestron Schmitt-Cassegrains? And I usually give the standard answer, which is that the edge version is built for astrophotography, but if you're just going to look through it, the gains are minimal. Now, Celestron does say that there are additional benefits to visual observing through getting the edge, but you know what? I've never actually had them side by side for a in close individual test until now. So this one is borrowed from a club member. He's actually leaving the country for some time and decided to just loan this to me because I expressed some interest in doing this test. So he said, well, why don't you just do the test and then give it back to me when I get back. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that here. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so I have two C nine and a quarters here. Longtime viewers of mine will know that this is my favorite schmidt cassegrain of all time. So what is an edge? Well, numbers-wise, it's the same. It's a 9.25-inch F10 schmidt cassegrain If you were looking through one or the other, you probably wouldn't notice anything amiss in either of them. They would appear identical. But the edge has some additional optical elements in here that make it better for astrophotography. The price difference is not small. At the time of filming, regular version around $1,500. The edge version, $3,000 twice the amount just to get that little extra bit of performance. Is it worth it? Well, let's find out. I'm gonna run some tests both visually and we're gonna to try to take some photographs to see what I think and then I'll give you my impressions at the end. Okay, so let's take a look at the back of the scopes here. We have the edge on the left here and the base model on the right. So I haven't claimed to have seen every version of the base model. These have had minor variations through the years. This is an early, what they call, flat back version. The edges tend to look the same. This is a so-called triangle back here. So I don't know if you can see this, but there actually is a lens element back here, which denotes that it is an edge. There's nothing in here at all with the base version here, but there's another couple of differences. First of all, that there are mirror locks here on the back of the edge version. So I have not actually seen this on any of the base models. Somebody correct me if I have that wrong. Also, the diameter of the visual back on the edge is larger. You actually do need this. They both do terminate in this two inch standard SCT visual back here. So you can use these, but on the edge, you do need this wider version here and it's important to note, don't lose that piece because Mead does the same thing. On their larger schmidt cassegrains there's a larger visual back here that is an adapter that goes to the standard two, two inch SCT. It does not fit on the Celestron. The Mead and the Celestron larger schmidt cassegrains have a different locking nut there, but they are different from one another. Be careful about that. Uh, so again, I haven't claimed to see every one of the base models, but I'm pretty sure every one of the base model nine and a quarters do terminate in the standard two inch visual back. Again, somebody correct me if I'm wrong about that. I brought both the base model and the edge here. We're gonna take a picture of that silo in the distance and I'm gonna use a full frame camera. This is my Canon 6D. We're gonna take the same picture and run some tests on image shift and we'll see if there's any difference in terms of vignetting and field flatness and sharpness at the corners. I have no idea what's gonna happen. Let's find out together. Here's the silo. That's the base version on the left, edge on the right. You can see neither scope filled the frame of the 60s full frame sensor. If you look at the upper left and upper right corners, you can see the edge did a better job, but it's close. Both scopes have impressively little image shift. This is something I've noticed in almost every C9 and a quarter I've ever seen. And by the way, some of you have asked why I tend to recommend somewhat larger amounts than everyone else per given optical tube. You're seeing part of the reason why here. These C9 and a quarters are mounted on my Celestron CGE. That's a pretty big mount. And yet you can still see how much the view is shaking just from me touching the focuser. I'll note they do sell these optical tubes paired with a much smaller and lighter AVX. Try to imagine how much worse that would be. On a clear night, I invited three club members over and we looked through the scopes side by side. We used identical AP Max Bright diagonals along with 35 millimeter panoptics, 26 millimeter type five Naglers, and 13 millimeter type six Naglers. 
we were interested in how the scopes performed at the edges. There's a couple of ways you can do this. You can look at a large busy area of the sky with lots of stars, like the field around cluster M35, or you can center a bright star or two and slowly move it to the outer edge and watch to see when it starts to distort. Visually, while all four of us saw a mild improvement at the edges, we all agreed the differences were small. If we didn't have the scope side by side, I don't think we would have noticed anything amiss in the base version. We all thought both scopes were excellent. Every image you're about to see are single frame 59 second exposures to keep everything the same. Look at the images of Mizar and Alcor taken with my Hutech modded 5D Mark III and a couple of things become apparent. First, ignore the differences in image brightness. You're going to see this over and over again here, by the way. The edge optical tube has Celestron's new Starbright XLT coatings, while the base version is an older tube with their older standard Starbright coatings. Its coatings may be deteriorating a bit. Again, it's hard, but ignore the differences in image brightness. You can see here again the edge has superior coverage on a full frame sensor, but again, the differences are small. You can also see a tiny bit more image sharpness in the edge towards the outer part of the image, but again, it's pretty close. Turning to M65, you see the same thing. Slightly better coverage and perhaps slightly better sharpness. Keep in mind you are trusting my ability to focus here, but I took a lot of these, many more than I can show you here, and this slight increase in sharpness was consistent. Looking at 59 second single frame exposures on M51, we see the same thing again. Slightly better coverage and perhaps slightly better sharpness, although this is the closest of them all and I'm tempted to call this one a draw. Again, ignore the differences in image brightness. I let the camera run and continue to take frames on N51 on both scopes and I stacked and processed the images in PixInsight. Keep in mind this is the least scientific of the comparisons as there were dozens of decisions made in both PixInsight and Photoshop, but I did my best to do the same operation in the same order on both images. These are cropped, I got tired of looking at the darkened edges. You be the judge here, I think they're pretty close. Here's a similar comparison on NGC 4565, the so-called Needle Galaxy. Again, the edge might be a little sharper, but it's really close. At this point, we're pixel peeping. Unless you had these side by side, I doubt you could pick these images out of a lineup. Finally, I did a more serious attempt on M51 through the edge. Halfway through this review, my CGE mount died on me, forcing me to use one of my AVX mounts. This was a real bummer. It got challenging as the AVX just isn't strong enough to hold these tubes steady for imaging. I had to throw out close to half the frames that I took. Still, I managed to get enough frames to stack. These are 30 59 second frames stacked with darks, processed in PixInsight and Photoshop. It isn't half bad. If anything, these tests remind me of just how much I like these C9 and a quarters, no matter which version I was looking through. There is one other thing worth noting, and this is subjective. I found the edges images to be slightly easier to process. I found I had to do less to get its images where I wanted to go. Having said that, I've always found deep sky imaging through schmidt cassegrains to be quite difficult. Webcam lunar planetary, I'm comfortable, but deep sky through these SCTs always seems to give me fits. So keep that in mind. Okay, so if you're curious, this is the way the scope arrived to me. Obviously, the owner of the scope is a serious astrophotographer. And there's no one right or wrong way to do this. This is just the way he has this thing set up for deep sky imaging. So obviously you see the base optical tube here. At the top, this round cylinder here is the camera itself. This one happens to be a QHY-268. It's the monochrome version. Because it is the monochrome version, this disc here is the filter wheel assembly. And I think he has something like four or five filters inside of it. This red item here is the off-axis auto guider. You may recognize that as a planetary imager that I sometimes show on this channel. And it is a planetary imager, but many of those things can double as auto guiders. This object here, which is a little bit hard to see, this cylinder is a 0.7 focal reducer. It speeds things up a little bit. This item here is an electric focuser that is remote operated. This is a dew removal system. A lot of this stuff just plugs into your laptop. You've got a lot of USB connectors here, connectors here for the dew heating system. And I believe the owner says he uses Nina for his image capture software. 
So I point this out because I have people contacting me all the time wanting to get into astrophotography, even though they don't have a lot of experience. You know, you want to watch what you're getting yourself into here. So this, the scope here is around $3,000. All that other stuff that I just mentioned, depending on how you buy it, you could easily wind up spending another $4,000. And that doesn't even include the most important part of your astrophotography rig of all, and that is the mount. Astrophotography begins with the mount. It's the one thing you should master before you go on to anything else. A suitable astrophotography mount for this rig, I mean, I'm counting around 32 or 33 pounds here all told, you're going to be spending another three to $4,000 on a good mount. So hardware-wise, you're looking at $10,000 there's still no guarantee you're going to get a good astro image out of this thing. There's software, there's interconnections, there's cables, there's all sorts of processes that you have to learn. And many of these items that I have just talked about here do have their own learning curve. So please do keep that in mind before you get involved in astrophotography. Okay, so should you get this telescope? I'll tell you what I think. If you're just going to look through the scope, I'd get the base version. If you're just going to be doing webcam lunar planetary imaging, get the base version. It's only when we get to deep sky imaging that things get a little more complicated. At the start of the review process, I would have told you, get the base version. The gains here are small, and I think you can probably compensate for at least some of those things through post-processing. As time went on, though, I began to appreciate some of the things that the Edge was doing for me. And they were little things. A little bit more usable field, a little bit more sharpness, especially at the edges, a little easier workflow. And there really wasn't one killer feature that made this thing worth it to me. Rather, it was the little things when you add them together kind of added up to something a little bit more significant. And I started to really appreciate this. So. Would I pay the extra? This $1,500 difference, the twice the price here, is not insignificant. You're going to feel that when you pay for this thing. So here's what I would say. If I were in the market for a C9 and a quarter and I was serious about deep sky imaging, what I would probably do is see if I could find a clean used sample of one of these. If I could get a few hundred dollars off, get the price down a little bit, I think I'd go for it. So again, keep in mind these differences are small. When I ask the guys to put a number to it, like how much better is this than this, the numbers came back pretty small, like around 5% or so. But having said that, serious astrophotographers are almost a breed apart, aren't they? If you tell an astrophotographer that they can get a 2 or 3% improvement and all they have to do is spend some money, they might just go for it. As always, the decision is yours. Let me know how you're doing. I hope this has been helpful to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.